With that, I'd like to introduce Jim Cooper. Thank you, Rick. Thanks. Thank you, Rick. I appreciate that kind introduction. And I must admit, I'm a little bit intimidated because each one of you make a living by being the smartest person in the room. So <laughs> there's a lot of competition here today. Uh, I'm grateful for the chance to be here. My friend Mike Saint is actually the one who prompted me to come, but I see so many other good friends in the room, Michael Collins, folks like that. I want to be of maximum use, so please feel free to interrupt me or um, challenge me, anything you feel like. I'm used to doing this. I've taught at OWA now for a number of years. I've spoken at virtually every uh, famous college and university in the country on health care issues because I'm uh, um, really not very smart about health care. I'm just pretty smart for congressman. And that's a low bar. And uh, <laughs> Also remember that since Congress is at a record low approval rating right now, I'm glad to be invited anywhere. So. Um, let's see if this thing works here. That's the sort of animal I am. And a lot of folks, even very smart people, don't quite understand the political process. So let me give you a very quick primer here, quick and dirty. People wonder what motivates folks. And an old American historian named Henry Adams described it best. And this was in the Gilded Age. And this is the grandson of presidents. He said that the purpose of a political party is the systematic organization of hatred. And there has never been a truer statement. And the party that succeeds is usually the party that's best at that task. Now, that's kind of a static analysis. Another way to put it is actually a description of liberals and conservatives. And the purpose of the liberal party is to keep on making mistakes. The purpose of the conservative party is to refuse to correct those mistakes. <laughs> and to me, nothing better captures the dueling negativism that we see, uh, not just in today's politics, but throughout most of history. The sort of yin and yang of politics where Democrats are idealistic and hopeful and not that practical or organized, and Republicans are super competent and not that compassionate or imaginative. And Together, we'd be perfect. It's like husband and wife. But separately, we just keep nagging on each other. And we leave it up to the public to decide and independence, like this crazy animal you see right here, which really isn't described in most annals. And there are no conventions for people like this. I'm officially a blue dog Democrat. Nobody knows what that is. That's a yellow dog that's been strangled blue by both <laughs> liberals and right. Essentially, what's happened during your lifetimes and this has happened so slowly that you're not aware of this, is we have lost our Congress in America. Because a Congress votes his conscience and his country. And that means you never really vote with your party more than about 80% of the time. And that's what I still do, because I don't know any party that's right more than 80% of the time. But today, people in Washington, people you support or think you like, vote with their party 95 to 99% of the time, like a member of a parliament does. And if you do that, you don't need a brain. You need a leash. So that's the challenge, because so many Americans are unthinkingly supporting this parliamentarization of American politics. And we've lost the folks like me in the middle. We are endangered species. Might, might be the last, you know, I'll probably be the last white Southern Democrat in America. It's getting thin. You, know, you have to go 200 miles or more in any direction from here to find another one. So quick course on politics. Let me get into the substance here. First theme is treatment. You all have, should have the slides at the desk. This is, should be blindingly obvious to everybody, but it's not. And the implications are staggering. Only 10% of what we do in remedial medicine, doctors and hospitals, is helpful. 90% is other stuff. 40% is our own stupid behavior. 30% is genetics, which so far we can't do too much about, although this recent DNA study is amazing. It's like we've gone from Google Earth, the genome, now to Google Maps, you know, with the latest findings. 15% uh, is socioeconomic. We can do something about that if we choose to. 5% is environment. But we all focus on this 10% of doctors and hospitals, and there are tons of problems they can't fix. They're not intended to fix. But most of what I'll be talking about today, sadly, is about this remedial fixing it up when it's too late part. So 
it would be so wonderful if one day we can get to population health, which is one of the things that Rick was kind of talking about in his, his comments, to focus on more than just the patient in front of our eyes, but uh, Americans or Tennesseans. If you understand the implications of what I said, the 900-page bill, and this is according to the official Supreme Court count, John Roberts, only 900 pages, not the alleged 2,700 pages, because that's like triple spaced, you know. Uh, it could have been two words, diet and exercise. Everybody knows that, but people don't want to hear it. The worst enemy we face is our own human nature. People do not want to hear it. We spent our lives in search of the fat-free donut. And <laughs> this is, I don't know if you were serving them out there today, but I didn't see any. Mm. This is why we talk past each other. These are all intelligent folks, doctors, patients, business people, and they all come from completely different ideas here. Doctors are motivated by the Hippocratic Oath, first do no harm. Patients just want to live. Businesses want to make money. And if you start with that premise, it leads you to completely different conclusions. And the most revealing line in many ways is this one. For a physician, one penny of harm is not worth it, but they'll spend you blind until they are actually hurting you. Here, if your copay is a dime, then you want to get your dime's worth. You really don't care about the dollar. And for the business guy, if he's paying a dollar in premium, he wants a dollar of return. These are all completely rational and yet divergent opinions. So how do you get these folks to talk to each other? This is why we have a problem. And this is why some boards of directors will not allow a single physician on the board, because it's so hard to get them out of their eight to 12 year of training mindset of just wanting to um, do everything possible as long as you're not harming the patient. So how do we promote communication in this sort of environment? I like the Dartmouth work. Uh, it's amazing what Dr. Jack Weinberg has done. His latest book, Tracking Medicine, which we'll get into in just a minute, is astonishing. And I particularly love this chart because it's got the predictable bad news on it, the excessive Medicare reimbursement areas, which are in the darker shades of green. Uh, it's also got some good news in it, the areas that are outlined in red, which are the so-called high performance areas. And you can see that even in the midst of dark green, you've got some red, like near us here in Tennessee but unfortunately outside of our borders is Asheville, North Carolina. Why are they high performance? Because years ago they chose as a retirement destination community with the Biltmore and all that to organize healthcare in a better way. And they did something elementary and simple. They got their hospitals to cooperate. Like, imagine that. You know, you are visiting Nashville, the hospital mecca. And one thing our hospitals refuse to do is cooperate. Now, I'm mindful of antitrust. These folks got a state level antitrust exemption. You can do that. Politicians are happy to hand you that. So the one hospital does cancer, one does kids, one does heart. You know, divvy up responsibility so you get the increased volume. You can practice in an effective way and lower costs. Why can't we do that? You know, Scott and White in Texas, you know, they're these, those, so the challenge essentially is to grow the Geisingers of Pennsylvania to that next practice, that next township, that next county. So there's a lot of hope here. Unfortunately, distressing amounts of it are above the Mason-Dixon line because we are the capital of fee-for-service medicine. I once talked to a founders medalist here at Vanderbilt, a brilliant guy, top of his class, brain surgeon, and I asked him why he wanted to practice in a small southern town. And he said he wanted to be in the last place in America to be affected by managed care. He's a brilliant guy, but somehow he doesn't get the business side. You know, do you want unmanaged care? Chaos? You know, so the fee-for-service has many advantages, but it's not perfect. This is where women are living two years shorter in the red areas here than they were just a few years ago. Two years shorter. That's not progress. That's regress. You know, this is astonishing. That's particularly hard on women. Men aren't doing so well either, but it's particularly noticeable with women. Now, a lot of this is lifestyle. A lot of it's behavior. It's not all meth labs either, folks. <laughs> you are visiting the state right now that is number one or number two in over-medication, even though we're a healthcare capital. The average Tennessean is on 18.2 prescriptions per person per year. Now, it's not quite as high as it seems because if you get it refilled monthly, that's 12. 
But tons of Tennesseans are not on any meds at all. So this is two standard deviations outside the norm. We're the prize of the drug companies. One of my college <laughs> friends was head of Pfizer, and he thought this was great because Tennessee did more to help his bonus than any other state going. So this is astonishing when you see crazy, inexplicable variation like this. This is an updated chart, and here it's the white areas that your life expectancy is lower. And this isn't just the barbecue belt or the fried chicken belt or the sweet iced tea belt, but this is it's really kind of a killer belt. We've got to do, do better than this if you care about people, not just your individual patients, but people. This is an astonishing chart. This is overutilization of CT scans. And push button medicine is the easiest. If you push the button and you hear ta ching, that's a terrible mortal temptation. And this is, in some cases, kids are being irradiated for profit. Like, oh my God. How could we possibly be doing this? And there's a recent study that shows with electronic medical records that's not necessarily reducing excessive scans because people aren't bothering to read the convenient electronic charts. These, you know, tragedies don't need to happen. This is over-utilization. This is Wenberg's latest work. Uh, a yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, <coughs> well uh, one great place is to go to the uh, academy, like the Academy of Radiology. I used to be a trustee, for example, of the American Academy of Ophthalmology. I'm one of two lay people in America to have been on the inside of the inside of the inside of an academic medical specialty society. And it's not just because of these thick glasses either. Um, it was astonishing what I saw. These deans, these potentates of medicine want better practice, but they are unable to control their peers. And the bottom line is these are all political organizations, and they expect 16,000 ophthalmologists to show up to their convention every year. And if they don't have big numbers when they meet in Chicago, then the convention's a failure. So they have to serve them popular stuff. And they make fun internally of the cataract castles and things like that, and their colleagues who are acting out. But they have no ability to discipline them. So the first source is the academies themselves. Uh, some have done a better job of others of establishing standards. There are also other groups like the Institute of Medicine. Uh, there are guidelines that have been forming for years to have evidence-based medicine. But to have a repeat of a scan for no reason is just uh, undue risk and, and cost. So this would be a traditional view of medicine where 70% is medically necessary. And of course, medically necessary is the legal verbiage, the ticket to whatever you prescribe will be reimbursed. 29% is probably defensive medicine because we have real problems with malpractice in this country. Now, that's state by state. And this is one of the curious areas where conservatives suddenly want a national solution. And Tennessee actually manages this problem relatively well because we have a physician-owned malpractice insurance company here called SVMIC. Yeah. Sorry, I'm a little slow on the answer, but I just want to challenge your previous statement because I found it interesting that physicians have no control over their peers and they understand that there's no sanctioning organization, that type of thing. But back to your overuse of CT, we do, we work kind of all around the country of urban and rural. And one thing that we hear from the rurals is we have sometimes better equipment here because they get a lot of grants than they do at the major university centers, but they don't trust what we send them. So they don't even look at our reports, they redo it. So the question is, of these guys that are high and mighty and sitting on the boards, how many of them redo because they don't trust someone else? Well, You're getting it. You're talking about a couple of destructive hierarchies. One is academic arrogance, and you know we see it all the time. And you know uh, Harvard hates Duke, which hates Vanderbilt, and you know. Uh, but there's also yeah this urban rural thing, and because probably of the proliferation of foreign medical graduates for so long, like I used to represent an entirely rural area, and it was hard to find an American-born physician there. They were all from like Bangladesh or someplace. And that's gone on for years as a result of policy screw up because there are 18,000 medical graduates every year, but there are 24,000 residency slots. And instead of our medical schools accepting more folks, we just have had a vacuum cleaner that sucked up every foreign medical 
best way possible. So that's what they're used to in rural areas for so long that it's created a real urban-rural tension. It's, it's almost like so many of the motels are owned by foreign-born folks. And it's, it's, it's something we've allowed to happen in society because so many of the educated elite really don't go to a rural area except for a vacation home or something. So we have real fragmentation in our society that's unnecessary, but in medical context, it, there is real discrimination. They just assume that that doctor must not know much because he's practicing in that area. And you're as likely to find you know, a Harvard Medical School guy in a rural area as you are a BMW dealership. You know, it's just the economics are not there. Um, but defensive medicine is huge. Now, defensive medicine is not only due to malpractice fears, it's also due to fee-for-service medicine. Because there are plenty of incentives to do extra testing. And one of them is personal profit. But back to malpractice. Tennessee's innovation has been a physician-owned insurance company, SVMIC, which encourages doctor policing because you don't want your own premium to go up. You will monitor who's misbehaving because that affects your premium. So it's kind of like a fraternity on steroids here. You, you suddenly start paying attention. And then, of course, a tiny percentage of physicians are just bad docs. Okay, this is a traditional view. You can quibble over the percentages, but this is right. The astonishing Weinberg view is this, and hold on to your seats, because a lot of folks won't be able to handle this. Only 15% care is really medically necessary. Like, oh my god. Now, the rest of these things, preference-sensitive care, that doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad care. It just means there's a choice and without informed consent. And really what they call shared decision-making, because informed consent is still paternalistic and anti-patient. You really don't know whether you got the deal that you were looking for or not. But this category here, 60% supply-sensitive care, this is like the old joke, if you can't make a living as a one-lawyer town, you get another lawyer in, then you're both rich. You know, <laughs> increased supply increases demand. You know, it's called supplier-induced demand. Now, this is astonishing, and it's hard to note at the individual physician level, so usually they're offended when they hear about this. But group-wise, you can predict it. And you can predict, like if there's big tuition payment coming up, they're going to get extra profitable that month. You know, or if there's a big house payment, you know, this is correlated at a macro level and with astonishing specificity. So this is Wenberg's possibly last, but at least his latest contribution. And this is almost too much for most folks to handle. And this does not mean physicians are bad people. They're wonderful people. They're some of the smartest people in the world. But if we could include in their training some economics, some business, then they might know about Medicare, Medicaid, and also how to run their own practice. That would be great. Where does defensive medicine come into Um, well, that would be like the malpractice. Well, I'm um, screwed up here. So, yeah. um, let's see if we go back. Uh, this would be the malpractice thing. And it, well, and this and this is a sort of pure view, and you can fault any I academic for saying, you know, ideally we should have a tort system that doesn't in you know, um, lead to unnecessary fear. Now, the, there's a lot of unhappy research on this because the Harvard study of some years ago actually said we probably need more compensation for injured victims, but without the noise and the overhead and the shame that's in today's system. Because today it's only the worst cases, the most egregious verdicts. Yeah. Oh, Jim, you to... This is Larry Van Horn, who you'll be hearing from this afternoon, who's um, one of my co-professors here at home. And actually, he's a real professor. He's not a politician. So you can trust him. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now you can. Wait till you hear me this afternoon. Um, so the, the, the best economic estimate of the costs to the U.S. healthcare system of the entirety of malpractice, the litigation, the defense of medicine, all of that is about $55 billion a year. And that's, that's a Health Affairs 2010 fall. Where is where that was published? Now, fifty-five billion dollars sounds like a lot when you're talking about a two point six trillion dollars spend. It's rounding error. It's some physicians love to talk about, but it isn't worth much at all in terms of the big picture. Did it include malpractice insurance? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's 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 tiny. Okay. Yeah, the pure cost would be more like ten billion, according to these estimates. 
55 billion, 60 billion is all in. Yeah. I, I really sort of agree with you, 30%. I've done a couple studies with The challenge with that, though, is that the incentives for defensive medicine are perfectly aligned with the set incentives for profit maximization. Mm -hmm. And it's just a lot nicer to say, I'm doing it because I want to be, I don't want to get sued. But you're also doing it because you want to get paid. Well, I think that's mm -hmm. an interesting. I think the Kidney did a study not too long ago looked at where, what is the driver of healthcare costs. And they looked at, you know, uh, uh, where, where the factors are. And they end up looking at outpatient care mm -hmm. is the biggest driver. Why? Because it's paid on a fee-for-service basis. The more clicks, the more people you see, the higher your revenue base. So yeah. we, think about, we can talk about malpractice, we can talk about waste and, and fraud and abuse, but where that study ended up being is outpatient care because it's fragmented and it's based on a fee-for-service basis. Mm -hmm. There's a facility charge in there which drives the number. Exactly. But there's, there's one piece in the third bucket there because I think it, what you have to do is look at the, um, the rationalization of the market today. Because fundamentally, this is an economic issue. Right? The economic model is broken. But the rationalization as far as not scale is, I need to manage my revenue in aggregate because I'm not paid enough to do the right medicine. I don't have enough time with my patients. I don't have, it, it, it not, it's a rationalization, but I think it's important to be sensitive to why, uh, you know, how people are justifying it. Well, you're touching on some really important issues. I wish I had more time to get through all this. Let me uh, uh, focus, because one factor that's unpleasant to talk about is excessive lifestyle. Because I don't know a single lender who would tell you that physicians live within their means. It's just not the nature of the beast. So that pr should perhaps be another course that's taught in, in medical school. Uh, structure. This is how the government and folks, private insurance companies organize things. And this is a stunning realization here because we all hate single-payer Canadian care, right? Well, that's just like Medicare, and that's the most popular health insurance in America by far. And we really hate the British because that's government monopoly and, you know, nice and it's awful. Well, that's called the VA, which according to the Mayo Clinic and MD Anderson and a lot of the fancy folks actually statistically offers the highest quality care in America, period, end of story. But it's looked down on. It's looked down here on this campus because the VA, that's where the gomers come to get out of the My Emergency Room people. So this is astonishing, just the first two things. Our health fringe benefits, that was really an accident of history in America. And that's astonishing like the German sickness funds. And then for the uninsured, at least until health care kicks in, that's like self-pay, which you might as well be in a third world country for that. So this is an astonishingly diverse system that we don't want to acknowledge. TRE did this research. He's an excellent journalist. He took a bum shoulder around the world, and he did not find that he got the best treatment here in this country. Uh, another way of looking at this is a chart I came up with years ago. It shows in one slide what the American health system looks like. I'd never seen anything like this before, and I wanted something simple for my students. This is by age cohorts here on the bottom. How many million folks? Like the peak of the baby boom here, it's about 35, 45 year olds. There are about 22 million people there. That's the baby bust. This is the most depressing part of the line because once people start turning 55, they start dying. And most physicians know this. In England, they say when you turn 55, you get a little bit crumbly. Now, we're all in denial about that, and it's possible to live to 105 or 114. I have an 80-year-old staffer who's one of my hardest working people. His mother just passed away at 114. But you see the rapid diminishment population. We have Medicare here uh, for the Ulsters. We have Medicaid underneath here and CHIP for the poor people, the low income, but it's especially generous for poor children and pregnant women, things like that. But actually for childless adults, especially in the South, Medicaid is almost a cruel program because in some states, if you make 37% of poverty, you are too rich for Medicaid. Now that will change with health reform, but that's the system before reform. You have this amorphous pool of the uninsured that people can go in and out of uh, 50 million people, which is unthinkable in most other countries. But of course, the majority of the system is private health insurance. But you see, that's still in a bluish color here on this chart because it's still a government sort of program, even though it's private health insurance. How could this be? And this is like number one question on are you a smart consultant test. 
Uh, what's the government's third largest health program? Well, there's Medicare, there's Medicaid, then is it the VA? This program is way bigger than the VA, but it doesn't have an easy handle on it. It's the tax break for employer-sponsored health insurance, but it's $250 billion a year and counting. Now, because it's a tax break, people don't see this, it's not obvious, but this is a monumental distortion in the health economy in the United States because our private health insurance is massively government subsidized. You would not buy it probably without that subsidy. So that's one of the distortions we've got to deal with, and it's omitted from most textbooks. So these are all government programs here, even the private one. So, yes? So this is uh, people, not dollars. Yeah, people, yeah. Well, it's it's a little bit like a, a, a saddle. Some kids are horribly expensive. Most oldsters end up being expensive. You're not quite sure when. And don't buy this thing where you spend most of your money in the last six months of life because you never know when that last six months of life is. It's like the lady who heard that traffic accidents happen within 30 miles of home, so what does she do? She moves. You know, it's, it's like, <laughs> you know. Um, so there are some miracle cures that restore your life or at least put you in remission. You know, it's amazing what is possible medicine. I had malignant cancer over 10 years ago. I'm still here. You know, so this last six months of life thing is a little bit tricky. Now, sometimes it's more predictable. So it would look much more like a saddle. There's an incredible spike when people turn 65 because there's a lot of foregone care from 55 to 65, and people suddenly load up on the government once they're able to get on it. So that's generally what that chart looks like. But what most people are curious about, well, this is the American health system. This is what we know and love. This is the status quo. Now it's unsustainable. But what does it look like after health reform? Now, health reform hasn't quite kicked in, so what I'm going to show you is like a 2016 look. But there's astonishingly little difference. This is before, this is after. Healthcare did too little, health reform, not too much. Now, it's still controversial, but basically the big thing is to expand Medicaid here and reduce the uninsured population. And actually, more people by 22 million will be on private health insurance because the exchanges are all private options. Private options. Now, it's a government organized menu, but it's private options. Yes? And this was, yeah, well, tell people that. I do. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, I know. It's, uh, change is so difficult. The status quo and inertia have a majority on every vote, so you've got to somehow overcome that. Costs. This is what's killing us, and this is the real issue we've got to focus on. This is a Peter Orzag chart, which shows, and this is the most important part, the blue is demographic change. This is a good problem to have. We want there to be more seniors. We want them to live longer. This is a good problem. But the white area here above that is the bad problem. These are unjustifiable cost increases, price increases. And you can see it way outweighs the demographic problem here. So what are we going to do about it? Basically, in the next few slides, we're going to dig into that some. You've already gotten hints, both from treatment patterns and structure of the system what's causing this. But this is outrageous. This is why America spends twice as much on health care as the next most profligate nation on earth, which happens to be Switzerland. Yes, sir? You just very easily switch between the term cost and price. Well, and that's <laughs> good. You caught me. Uh, uh, health care is really the only industry in the world that has no cost-based accounting. We don't even know what the costs are. It's all what you've gotten away with charging. So in class, I try to be more precise talking about that. But Good for you. It's the harder. Yeah. Uh, it's astonishing what has become a justifiable price. And part of that was, you know, um, well, <laughs> forgive me. I, I have to speak regular English, too, when I go out and talk to real voters. So it's, precision is, is sometimes a nightmare. Uh, well, this is what we pay. Yeah. Uh, the, the real tragedy, one of the many tragedies of health care was uh, the fact that with cost plus reimbursement, which prevailed for too long, that was really double profits because the plus was guaranteed profit, 
but you could jigger your costs so that that was profit too. So it was win-win, and of course, tons of providers love that. And getting that out of the system has been a nightmare because people will fight, bleed, and die. Paul Starr of Princeton put it the best way. He said, we currently spend, what, 2.4, 2.7 trillion a year on healthcare. And that exactly and precisely equals what? 2.7 trillion in healthcare incomes. And once it's income, everybody will fight, bleed, and die to keep it exactly where it is and to increase it at inflation plus 2.5% a year, which has been the 40-year norm. Inflation plus 2.5% a year. And essentially, our challenge today is we, if we can just slow the rate of growth to inflation plus 1%, we will have solved two-thirds of the problem. So it's really a growth issue, and that's one of the things that's most difficult to understand. You know, in Washington, we call that a cut if you slow the rate of growth. But it's really going up, up, up. This is a powerful way to show it visually. This is where senior citizens live on the planet. You can show that America looks actually pretty normal here. Some countries are shriveled up like little raisins because there are virtually no seniors there. Some countries are huge like Japan. Uh, the Indians on a vegetarian diet actually do relatively well. You know, remember that diet and exercise thing. Uh, and by the way, if you switch religions, I'm pretty much guaranteed that you'll live longer. Now, you'd have to become a Seventh-day Adventist, but those are called blue zones around the country. There's a big thing on the radio this morning about eating organic, and people are willing to pay more at Whole Foods to do that. But just go to church on Saturday, and hey, you went out. But it turns out that living, living longer isn't as popular as, as, as people think. So this is where the people are. Europe, you can see, is pretty wildly distorted there. This is where the people are. Where is the money spent? That's our problem. So you take the white area in the chart, and you see which is where the money spent. Like, oh my god, what are we getting in terms of value received? So the topic of this talk is the shifting value equation. That is out of hand. This is more conventional chart. You can see it's Medicare and Medicaid that are killing us. But this is from a government perspective. And remember, we often omit the third largest health program in government, which is the subsidy for private health insurance. So if you add that into it, the chart looks like that's a nightmare. And see, our private friends think they're uninvolved in this when they're deeply involved. And one of the bravest parts of health reform is the so-called Cadillac tax. Now, there's a better, more direct way to face this issue. But it's the first time in history we've dared talk about this really since the 1950s. When due to congressional oversight, this got put into law. Uh, this shows all levels of government. And because of our federalist system, we oftentimes just focus on you know, national government or state government. But this is a spike that should terrify you. Because regular government is down here peddling along, police, fire, jails, national defense, education, blah, blah, blah. Something is completely out of hand here. And this is something, this is entitlement spending. Two-thirds of it is health care. But most people don't even think of this as government. Wherever Romney and Obama go, people say, I want to keep the government's hands off of my Medicare. Oh, my gosh. You know, we have a, what we have here is a failure to communicate. So we've got to <laughs> get people real on this. And I'm going to show you in just a second some of the slides here. Medicare is such an awesome deal. It's really too good to be true. Now, Medicare is a vital program. We've got to keep it solvent. But this is our central challenge as a nation to do this. So the drivers, what are they? This is the first lady to uh, retire as a baby boomer. Unfortunately, she chose to get Social Security at age 62, which will systematically shortchange her for the rest of her life. But we are so into immediate gratification, we can't even wait three more years. Now, for a few folks who've had hard manual labor jobs, maybe it's necessary. Or if you know you have a history of terrible disease in your family, go ahead and claim it. But most Americans should wait till they're 65, and we're not doing even that. This is something that you could help with as consultants because you're smart enough to understand accounting. The federal government is the last area in America that doesn't use accrual accounting. We only keep up with cash, not the credit card. This credit card is totally, unbelievably maxed out. And there's not one business group in America that supports real accounting for the federal government, not even the CPAs. So we are all living in a dream world. So somehow or another, we got to get this. The real debt isn't 15, 14 trillion. It's like 62 trillion at least. And that leaves out Medicaid. 
We have got to get real on this, but the Chamber of Commerce is not helping us, the NFIB is not helping us, and it goes without saying the hospital groups are not helping us. They were against the super committee succeeding. They are for, openly for, sequestration, which devastates national defense because the Medicare cuts there, their cuts are limited to 2%. So it's hard to imagine something more unpatriotic than that. But that is their selfish position and everybody's entitled to advocate what they want, but that is astonishing. Jim, what is the source of that data, please? Oh, this is all public stuff. The, uh, there's a report here for the $62 trillion. It's called the uh, Financial Report of the United States Government. It's issued by the U.S. Treasury on Christmas Eve every year. <laughs> Better time to hide something. This was a law passed by John Glenn, and the Treasury hates doing this, but it's the only government report that does use accrual accounting. So that way, and it's actually printed, you love this, in public company format, like it's an SEC document, uh, America Getting Ready to Go Public, IPO. And Mary Meeker out at Kleiner Perkins did an astonishing 420 slide show on this that you can get on the internet, which goes through as if you were a stock analyst saying, would you buy stock in this country? And it is a terrifying presentation because so many things are out of whack. Like historians will look back and say, they were an advanced society. They had the proper tools to understand and diagnose their problem. They refused to use those tools. And it's largely due to interest group pressure because for every elected official in Washington who might, on a brave day, want to understand this, there are 60 lobbyists for each one of us saying, don't understand that, don't look at that. Accounting is boring. And they really have us on this accrual thing because on TV, in a quick sound bite, that sounds cruel. And, <laughs> you know, we have gotten so simplistic and bumper sticker that most of my colleagues just hear that word and they run. They want to be friendly. They want to be lovable. They want to win the election. And another number to put this in context, Jim, the, uh, the Federal Reserve does an estimate of the total private net worth of all assets in the United States, and it's about $60.7 trillion. So we are more in debt than the total private worth, the total worth of all assets in our country. Is, is the commitment there, though, the two big chunks of it, right? One is uh, retirement benefits and out going forward and entitlement commitments going forward. Those are the two big chunks there? Well, it's retirement and health care. Uh, let me show you. Retirement is primarily Social Security. It's actually in pretty stable condition. That's an 8 to $12 trillion problem. This is a 30 to $60 trillion problem. Now, even for smart consultants, let's go over a million, billion, trillion, because they sound a whole lot alike. The best <laughs> meme device is a million seconds is 12 days. A billion seconds is 32 years. A trillion seconds is 32,000 years. This is a powerful way to think about it. It's completely terrifying if you understand real numbers. Now, for many voters, unless it's in a per capita thing, of your family's debt is $156,000 to the government or something like that, they won't get it. But as consultants, you can understand the macro situation. So this is an amazing, uh, okay. A million seconds is 12 days. A billion seconds is 32 years. A trillion seconds is 32,000 years. And you're headed back toward dinosaur time. See, each one is three digits. So when you're doing your scientific notation, and by the way, there's a wonderful book on this to refresh what you should have learned in high school. Is, uh, it's called Guestimation, Solving the World's Problems on the Back of a Napkin. And it's a whole book of what are called Fermi problems that are fascinating sort of mind games. There's another great book on this too. It's called Are You Smart Enough to Work for Google? And a number of their questions are Fermi questions. Questions without precise answers, but all you have to come up with is a ballpark because it's the thought process they're trying to reveal. Yeah. Do you see any, from your vantage point, any uh, macro solutions or course of action? To... Well, first of all, we have to get a proper diagnosis, and America's not even close to that. That's why I focus on accounting, which is normally boring, except for a smart group like this. But this is from Deloitte, and it actually shows the dimension of the problem. We in America, and nothing mentioned at any political convention, even the Republican convention, was more than this face of the problem. We are not looking at this face. And even Deloitte ducked there a little bit because it's not 50 trillion, according to the latest report. It's at least 62 trillion. And 
I don't want to scare you too much, but Bloomberg Businessweek had one article by a rogue journalist that even said the problem was 211 trillion. Because you really need to throw in things like Fannie and Freddie, and there are tons of other things, IMF, there are lots of stuff out there. But just our core problem is at least 62 trillion, which is you know, four or five times bigger than is publicly admitted. I have been to the Wall Street Journal three times to beg their editorial board to use accrual accounting like Dow Jones has to use when they're describing the U.S. government. They are refusing to change the journalistic standard. This is astonishing. So we're in a bubble. Somebody mentioned earlier, and I don't want to be too negative because you can make an argument we're okay and sustainable because if we just slow the rate of growth to inflation plus 1%, we solve two-thirds of the problem. But I don't see that happening. For most of the folks I know, if interest rates were just to return to normal, there'd be a depression because young people are thinking, oh, it's normal to have a 3 or 4% mortgage. Well, my first mortgage was 17%. <laughs> you know. So just returning to normal would be an economic you know, drag on our economy. Medicare and Medicaid, we've talked about private health insurance. Don't forget, that's the government's third largest health program. Now, one of the great tragedies of thinking is virtually every device or pharma company wants you to believe that there is not a plus sign here in front of technology. But every equation in healthcare, it's plus. The greatest living healthcare economist is probably Victor Fuchs out of Stanford. I'm also an Alan Entoven fan. Talk to all these guys, Gruber at MIT, you name it, David Cutler at Harvard. Larry Van Horn here at Vanderbilt. This is a plus sign. But we all go through life pretending it's minus. A new invention is going to save us money. Now, every once in a while, at the margins, it will save you a little money. But sooner or later, the medical establishment figures out a way to make more money off the deal. And of course, living longer is more expensive. And we're for that. That's the good problem. But usually, it involves ways, hey, Herb, you can see a true master <laughs> of capitalism here. <laughs> I know. I know. IQ in the room did go up. He's yep. not only a great CEO, but um, an actuary. That's not, that's not a fun profession, but a necessary <laughs> one. So understand this technology thing. And again, our device and pharma friends don't want you to think this, but remember I said that Tennessee is wildly over-medicated? Tennessee is not just over-medicated. We're also number one or number two in America in terms of prescription narcotics. And I've had a top state official tell me, oh, it's just hydrocodone and that's affordable, so... If they want to get high, that's fine. And th this is not a meth problem in a rural area. These are respectable white collar people all over Tennessee who have gotten addicted to stuff that Purdue Pharma and some others are handing out. This is wrong, but it's happening and they've gotten it largely because it's free. This is a chart showing how good a deal Medicare is. And put yourself on this chart, but you will find that Medicare is probably one of the best investments you've ever made in your life. You get at least a threefold return, sometimes higher than that, on what you paid into Medicare. And these are the folks who just retired now, because in 94 we allowed more Medicare payments, and in recent years it's to the max of your earned income. But if you retired like in 94, 95, the maximum you could have paid in. The maximum was a few thousand dollars. So Larry's more mischievous than I. We require our students to go back on Thanksgiving dinner and tell their parents about the situation and get them to write us a letter. And we get deeply angry letters because people can't handle the truth. You know, they say, oh, I paid in way more than that. I have a bill right now before Congress with Paul Ryan. I'm a bipartisan guy that would send everybody in America a Medicare letter saying what you paid in and what your expected benefits are because that's the news you can use. And has that bill moved in committee? No. <laughs> they don't want people to know. Yes, sir. Mm. I have a question. I'm not an economist. I'm a clinician. Um, what's the difference between the Medicare Advantage and Well, that would be a private contractual matter between your dad and his employer. Uh, lots of companies have shelved their retirement health plans, or at least made it a uh, secondary payer. Medicare is primary. Uh, that's a matter of private business and contract, and that's whether employees have the power to negotiate. 
And this is also the huge problem that GM and other large companies had with far more retirees than current workers. A legacy problem that a lot of companies did not own up to. Because we had to force better accounting, not only in large companies, so they would acknowledge their problems, we had to force it on the states. And two states, and these are relatively sophisticated states, Connecticut and Texas, were so mad that they would have to use real accounting for their pension liabilities that they, in their state legislatures, tried to repeal the laws of accounting. That is as silly as trying to repeal the law of gravity. But in both Connecticut and Texas, the legislature tried to do this. But that's the level of denial we have in our society. So it's not just at the individual level, it's at the state legislative level. It, on those numbers there, where you got the, the uh, contributions of 60,000, that's just what you put in each year added up. That's not what the, you were putting it in the private account, and it would appreciate at 3 or 5% a year. That's yeah, but, but see, remember, you quite rightly point out, money should have a time value. But these are flow-through programs. These are not bank account programs. These have never been bank account programs. You pay in one month, that's paid out the next month to some total stranger. Well, I understand. Yeah. yeah so, you were putting it in for yourself, though, as opposed well, to giving it to the government if you had a Well, you, you should have your own health savings account, in which case the money could accumulate. Yeah. But people are taking this first as a full retirement, full health benefit, and they're not realizing the nature of the program. Yeah. So. Uh, that's one of the grandest misconceptions in all of American politics. The, the other thing that insult to injury on that is that back, if you go back in time, we had six people paying for every one person driving benefits in any given period. And that's dropping off kind of the demographic cliff. So not only are, have costs going things crazily, but we've got, we're having the number of people who are actually funding it for all the retirees. So it just compounds in the, the magnitude of the problem. This shows uh, levels uh, of, of Medicare dependence in different parts of the country. You can see again that some of the proudest, most independent, anti-government areas of the country are the most heavily dependent on Medicare. It's even worse. This mailbox money is basically almost taking over America. And here again, people don't think of this as government. This is just they're getting their own money back, and they're disappointed they didn't earn 5% on their money all these years they paid into it. Uh, this is Medicaid, which is a little more scattered. These are some of the Indian reservations out west. But this is astonishing. Look at eastern Kentucky. Oh, my God. And of course, you know, two-thirds of Medicaid money isn't spent on poor people. It's spent on seniors and nursing home care. And the spend-down provisions, there are 5,000 elder law attorneys in America who are happy to help you figure out how to craft your spend-down provisions so that your loved one can qualify for welfare. This is an amazing thing. And again, some of the biggest beneficiaries are the most resentful and hostile. So there's not even uh, uh, like gratitude here. This is back to politics a little bit because so many people don't understand this. Opposites attract. Only Nixon could go to China. And for those of you who are too young, you don't remember, Nixon was the top communist hater in America. Uh, was, did a fabulous job trying to ferret out Alger Hiss and all these folks. If any Democrat had shaken hands with Mao Zedong, they would have been labeled a communist and a sympathizer and a turncoat and a Benedict Arnold. So only Nixon could get away with it. Well, this isn't just an anomaly, an eccentric. This is a trend. Because look at this. This is in the Wall Street Journal this last weekend. Republican presidents have grown entitlement spending by 8% more than Democrats. Every year they've been in office. Like, and yet we have the label, we're the big giveaway folks. They're out competing us. And it's not just the Medicare drug bill. This is astonishing. And this was written by the Republican a writer for the Wall Street Journal. He's at the American Enterprise Institute, Nicholas Eberson, the Republican think tank. Now, he's just telling the truth. So why can't we all just get along? Well, we should, but, but, but see, understand the stereotype. Another little quiz. Who was the biggest government president post-World War II in America? Ronald Reagan. Until Obama, and that's larger now, but only slightly more. President Reagan got government up to 23.5% of GDP. He was a big government conservative. Which is to say, he wasn't that conservative. He talked a really good game, but in terms of size of government. Now, we worked years to get that back down to size. But this is, a lot of folks don't understand. And the smallest government was under Bill Clinton. 
like by far. He got government down to 19% of GDP. And these percentages, and this is the proper way to measure size of government, these percentages are, are huge. Each percentage point makes a big difference. So this is an amazing thing, and people need to understand this. So one reason I've been for Obama is that it really takes a liberal Democrat to curb entitlement spending. It takes a liberal Democrat to take on teachers unions. It takes a liberal Democrat because they've got the credibility to do that. And the Republicans are useful for other things. But it's this opposites attract thing that uh, you've got to try to understand. Can you elaborate? <laughs> well, uh, I, again, I'm pretty bipartisan, but it's, uh, Republicans would be great at reforming the tax code, as Ronald Reagan did. But remember, he failed the first time. Because we now spend more in tax breaks than we do in all government appropriations. And we don't even know where most of that money goes. If there's any category of spending that's worse than entitlement spending, it's tax breaks. Because you don't really even know who the beneficiaries are. And you don't know whether you're getting your money's worth. You know, I can quote you testimony from Bush Treasury officials saying, tax breaks are unverified and unverifiable, unmeasured and unmeasurable. And yet we know that it's over $1.3 trillion a year. And a classic example is if you are a healthcare company and you get fined a billion dollars for Medicare fraud, fully tax deductible. Well, <laughs> I know. Yeah. Rick Scott should not dare come back to Nashville. He might be arrested. Does that trend hold for a Republican or Democratic majority in Congress? That's the key thing. Those are frequently inversely related, right? And so well, this is somewhat of a fallacy attributing all of this to, well, this to the president. Well, I can show you the full quote. He attributes it to presidents. And this is the Republican think tank. Now, we have, by plan of the founders, separation of powers and federalism, which makes it hard to allocate responsibility. But this author, at least, in this article this weekend, says it's the president. Because they. Well, well uh, this is a free country, and you're entitled to you know, that fatalistic cynicism. Uh, I think, <laughs> as some of the smartest people in the world, though, if you can't figure it out, then we better get ready to work for the Chinese. You know, you know, so. Well, but see, this is where America is always, we have a republic here. We do not have a democracy. We have relied on representative government. We've relied on a formed elite to help other people make their decisions. And you all are part of that informed elite. So take that responsibility seriously and help people understand, because this country is worth saving. And this isn't that hard if you just take a few moments to understand it. But we've all become such a TV, instant gratification society that any homework at all, you know, there's a, a Nashville school opened up recently, and as part of their advertisement, they promised parents there would never be more than one half hour of homework for your kids at night. My wife and I immediately walked out. But every other parent was saying, yeah, <laughs> more time for football. This is not the way to grow a country. I tell all my interns, I have one of the largest intern programs in Washington, for us to be number one, you have to be number one. Are you better, smarter, stronger than your Chinese or Brazilian or German or Russian counterpart? And our kids aren't even growing up that way. And you start with language. Most of these folks, in my interns this summer, had all Americans, one Chinese kid. Guess who got the only good score on the English grammar test? <laughs> the only good score, the Chinese kid. And he's only been familiar with our language for six years. How is our Chinese? We don't presume to know any, much less beat Chinese at Chinese. Well, no, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying rigor. You know, where is the rigor? But kids are watching six hours of TV a day, and this suits the commercial enterprise. So just, again, one of our biggest barriers, and you're highlighting it, is just our failure or unwillingness to understand our own political system. We've had 230 years to get used to this system. It really hasn't changed a lot. Well, yeah. Congressman, 
all these problems have been created by the supposed delight in Washington. We're, we've got this Medicare funding shortfall and Medicaid funding shortfall, Social Security messes because the people supposedly that knew what they were doing set these programs all up and they didn't fund them correctly to begin with. I mean, private oh. industry, we got away from defined pension plans years ago. Well, uh, most industries did anyway, except well. for the car factory. First of all, most people who are in the elite would say elite, not elite. Um, second, in a democracy, even in a republic, you're responding to public pressure. And in the Depression, when Social Security was founded, the poorest age category was seniors. And then Nick, or LBJ brought us to Great Society. And a lot of these programs have gotten completely out of hand because of corporate exploitation of the reimbursement. We have built empires. You know, I don't want to get too specific here, but when do you think HCA was started as a corporation? It started After Medicare became law. So there's a crony capitalism, a symbiosis here that we need to understand. Remember I said earlier there's 60 lobbyists in Washington for every one of us? Sure. Who pays for those folks? Most people now run for Congress so that they can become a lobbyist. That is deeply unpatriotic. Well, All we are is a farm team for K Street. And groups that you work for are making that happen. So if you want to get real about this and tell the truth, get real accounting for the federal government. Help us with that. Well, I've, been, I've been saying that since I was in college. Well, show me and show me what group you've succeeded with. I'm at this every day. I got a book out on this six or eight years ago. This does not make me popular because if you have real accounting, people know where the bodies are buried and they hate that. System's broken, and I'd really be interested in your perspective. Uh, I mean, yeah. Accounting is one. Are there are there things that are realistic, structural that oh. we can focus on to fix government? And, and, I'm I and I would add to that if you could comment on. I mean, if we if we don't rely upon the lobbyist, because I'm one of those guys that informs companies about what's happening in Washington and how it affects us. Uh, from a payment standpoint, a profitability standpoint, if we don't rely upon the American Hospital Association, the Federation, and all the other lobbyist groups to inform the congressman and senate on how this legislation should be written, then who do we rely on? Well, how about electing intelligent people? Well, Wouldn't would that be novel? Yeah. You know. <laughs> You know, I had a but, vote for you, but, but I'm but in your district. But I can tell you, I, would vote I just researched this the other day. By 1795, George Washington himself was already deeply worried about the quality of people being elected to Congress and his inability to attract people to be in his cabinet, and that was George Washington. So you cannot delegate authority in a democracy. You have to step up and volunteer and serve. That's why our military is the best in the world, but our political system is not as badly broken for people who want an in-depth, peer-reviewed, look at this. I made a speech on this at Harvard about two years ago. Ten political scientists analyzed it, picked it apart. They basically found like almost nothing wrong with my analysis. You don't have to trust me, though. Two leading political scientists in Washington, one Democrat, one Republican, Tom Mann and Norm Ornstein, one Brookings, one American Enterprise Institute, have written a book not only called The Broken Branch about Congress. Their follow-up book is It's Even Worse Than You Think. But <laughs> These are not books that are selling because we'd prefer to keep up with the Kardashians and folks like that because our entertainment, infotainment society is literally entertaining us to death. So right we have forgotten what news is like and we do not choose to watch it when it's made available. CNN is sinking because we prefer to cocoon with Fox or MSNBC, both of which are giving you more propaganda than news. So this is part of the, the political thing. But let me finish a couple slides here. We'll be, how do you know? Goals, what are we actually aiming for here? Fee-for-service world, we can go up through consumer-driven health plans, which have a lot in their favor, greater personal responsibility. We should all be for personal responsibility. There's another path here, provider responsibility, through things like capitation, risk-bearing, you're familiar with that. But the goal is wellness, and almost no part of the country is there yet, even if you're in one of these Geisinger-type worlds. So how do we get there? Ideally, you could use a little of both, both provider and personal responsibility. But that's really what we're aiming at. And how do we do that with legislation? These are some of the biggest questions that I think are still remaining. Remember the core business of government? 
and everybody should know what your core business is. This is the standard Peter Drucker question. The core business of government is insurance. 70% of what the government does is insurance. It's taught in very few, even graduate schools of business. And insurance is just complicated enough. It's a little bit like that P game with the three shells. You can not understand what the insurance thing is all about. Without real accounting, and a Bush Treasury official said this, he's now at BlackRock, said, America's not a country anymore. All we are is an accident waiting to happen. And what have we done about this? Almost nothing. What's between defined benefit and defined contribution? The dichotomy that y'all are so used to, you referred to it. There's something in between that's probably better because if you understand, you know that individuals are probably not really good risk managers. They're probably just a sucker for the latest stockbroker. You know, it's not rocket science, but too many people don't have the skills or the ability to even manage their own affairs. So we need some device where people can group their skills and they can be good at what they're good at and yet not left to the wolves. So be thinking of something between DB and DC. How to exit the poverty trap? This is a perennial problem because we want people to be able to work themselves up. And if you face a marginal tax rate of 70 to 90 percent, you know, many rich people just leave the country. Well, that's what poor people face today as they <coughs> try to exit some of these programs. One of the most important things we need is the courage to say no. The ability of a doctor to tell a patient no. And many doctors are afraid to do that. Many politicians are afraid to do that. And I think it's your true friends who are willing to tell you no. You've got to know the truth. And we are in denial. Because the old phrase in politics is if a politician says yes, he means maybe. If he says maybe, he means no. And if a politician says no, you know he's not a politician. So we need to encourage elected officials and others to tell you no. That's the wrong thing to do. Not just out of spite, but you know, for self-discipline reasons. The courage to apply treatments that work. A number of these problems are actually more solvable than we think, but we so instinctively shy away. Like one of my students here at Vanderbilt said, if we have an obesity problem, why don't we charge patients by the pound? <laughs> well, there'd be some interest group that objected to that. If we have an obesity problem, why is SNAP, the food stamp program, allow you to buy unhealthy food? If we're worried about food deserts, why can't SNAP benefits be used for healthy foods? And that would encourage a lot of inner city grocery stores to start stocking things that their people could buy. But again, there'd be a thousand lobbyists saying, oh, you can't do that. You have a right to kill yourself with junk food. You know, you know there are so many things that are elemental. Just pricing externalities makes all kinds of sense. But we refuse to do it. So there are tremendously powerful uh, answers to some of these problems. It's just sometimes we're afraid to use them. One of the classic ones, and you've all faced this, I'm sure, you know, of a young kid with an earache, you go to the doctor, they prescribe an antibiotic. We have run through 400 years of antibiotics in this country in 40 years when the doctor knows the antibiotic won't do any good. These are viral infections. In like 90% of the cases, they're going to heal themselves. All the antibiotic does is run, increase the resistance of the poor child. So actually, in that case, ethically, the doctor is not even treating the right patient. The patient is the anxious mother or father. Usually, it's the mom. And the kid is being mistreated in order to appease. It would make more sense medically if you gave the mom Prozac to calm her down <laughs> instead of the poor child that's the victim. And yet, thousands of times a day all over America, this sort of crazy misuse of the system is happening. And we've all participated in it. So this isn't poor folks on dope or meth or anything. This is us. So let's wake up, smell the coffee, and have a better, better health care system. Yeah. Picture, OK. Totally 
Well, but, but remember who you're working with here. You know, tons of folks, and no amount of education is going to help. That's why I say, what's the motivation? Well, there's, there's logic. this is why we have FDA and food safety rules. You could pick out healthy vegetables on your own, but we try to make sure that they're not going to kill you before you buy them. Same with drugs and meats and lots of things. So exactly. there. Well, it does, but, you know, why do we have Social Security and Medicare? These are forced savings programs to do what people should have done on their own. But people in the choice between ant and grasshopper are usually like grasshoppers. Now, changing human nature is an ambitious... Uh, in the meantime, let's make sure people are not... In the, in the last 40 years, I would say, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about this afternoon, the world's been completely unglued. From the time that I was a kid, and my parents paid for my delivery out of pocket in a hospital, and they paid for me to go to a pediatrician out of pocket, um, to a world now where we're expected, nobody wants to pay more than five or ten dollar copay to go and consume healthcare services. We've completely, in one generation, 40 years, upset the apple cart and changed people's expectations. And yeah, and furthermore, the healthcare reform legislation just embodies it and encodes it such that you're not responsible, you're not individually underwritten. <clears throat> it completely screws with the laws of underwriting. Irv's the best person to talk about that. And you're not, it's not your, you're not responsible for anything. We're going to give you stuff. So in 40 years, we completely ch uh, changed the public discourse and expectations and contract with America in a very dysfunctional way. Mm -hmm. And to give you an idea of the disconnect, 75% of Tea Party members think Medicare is the best program going. So people are not getting it. They're protesting government, but they're not realizing that they're strongly supportive, even more supportive than average folks, of one of the most important but still dangerous programs in the country well, until it's probably funded. Turn on investment chart. You showed us earlier. I figured that out. <laughs> well, but when it's too good to be true, you're, you get a time bomb on your hands. Yes, sir. Um, this is what's lobbied. Yeah. Well, it's fine to talk syntaxes and things like that. These are the most lobbied issues in Washington because they're even more powerful than entitlement programs. It takes an extremely popular president to do any tax reform. Even Ronald Reagan, at the height of his popularity in 1986, failed utterly with his first tax plan, the relatively pure one. He only succeeded in the second modified one. And there is still, like if you're in the real estate industry or anything like that, you are going to fight tax reform till the end. So we have a monumental problem helping Americans understand first their current breaks, like with the private health insurance tax break, which we're in denial about, and countless other tax breaks. So getting real on this issue is one of the hardest things ever. It's harder than health reform. And without a popular president, I see almost no way of uh, getting it done. Because the individual members of Congress are wholly owned subsidiaries of now largely pharmaceutical companies. It used to be the tobacco companies. We switch masters. You know, it shouldn't be this way. Well, when most of my colleagues are just wanting to go be a lobbyist, that's their career path that is determining their current votes. And we are not only doing nothing about that, we are encouraging that to happen because one of the grievances we have is like Congressional Country Club. Tiger Woods won this year. It's a beautiful club. You see it on TV. All my constituents here want me to get them on, of course, because it's Congressional Country Club. I say, well, I don't belong. I don't know anybody who belongs, who's a member of Congress, because we can't afford it and we can't get through the waiting list. But it's called Congressional Country Club, so everybody thinks it's our perk. We should change the name. It should be called Lobbyist Country Club, because that's who <laughs> belongs and runs it. So, so you're completely optimistic about tech policy. Well, without folks like you, multiplied, cloned by millions, we can't even have honest accounting in government much less fundamental reform. And see, this disconnect when people are cocooning with what they want to hear. And 75% of Tea Party members love Medicare because it is too good to be true. This is a fantasy world. And we should be living in a spreadsheet world in which people live within their means. But I already mentioned one class of folks who almost always live beyond their means. But everybody is this way. There, there are stunning problems here. Um, 
The Wall Street Journal had a great column by Austin Goolsby talking about how most states in America are actually more like Greece than Germany. 30 states are more like Greece than Germany. You know, and yet every state, you heard it countlessly at the conventions, oh, we balance our budgets. No state balances its budget. They don't even attempt it. Tennessee's, 45% of the Tennessee budget is free from the federal government. So they balance their budget? Well, with our 45% subsidy, that's a lot of money. You know, we give $15 billion a year. And they totally take it for granted. That's a bigger bailout than Greece is expecting. And yet we're not Greece. So this, the levels of denial and unreality are so staggering that Larry and I have a hard time helping our students to handle it. And their parents are completely off. They just don't want to acknowledge that you know, there's such a massive disconnect. So I, I haven't given up hope. I still get up and work hard every day. But without more folks like you getting engaged, making things happen, we are in real trouble. I have given up hope. <laughs> well, <laughs> well he's, he's not kidding you either. He, he has. He lives on a farm, a bunker compound south of here. And he, he's he's going to be ready for whatever comes. And he is well armed, too, so don't mess with Larry. I, I've gotten you way off schedule, so I don't want to hurt John's program. Yeah. Yeah. No, term limits would uh, accelerate the becoming a lobbyist situation. Yeah, but it doesn't, you know, it prevents a politician from doing what somebody else wants them to do because they want to get reelected. No, but see, they're already doing what the lobbyists want because they want these jobs, and it would just guarantee. You, the average tenure today in Congress is six to eight years. See, people don't even know what's going on. You think we're gone all the time and out of touch. The truth is we only work in Washington 90 days a year. We're back home 270 days a year. And we may be too much in touch because we're too busy handing out bread and circuses. You know, and the folks who are really handing it out is the permanent government in Washington where they stay for 30 years and they make a couple million dollars each a year. And those are the lobbyists. You know, so understand your own government here. So how about what I suggested earlier, getting intelligent, honest people to run for office? Wouldn't that be nice? How about getting them to sign a pledge that they won't become a lobbyist? Wouldn't that be nice? That's a good idea. Yeah, because it's garbage in, garbage out otherwise. Let's have quality in. And then if there's a good one, do you want a doctor to operate on you who's never done it before? You want somebody who knows what they're talking about. Now, you don't have to be a nerd like me, but there are tons of my colleagues who. I guess we're jaded. I'm from originally from West Virginia. So. Oh, my God. Well, well, well. Uh, um, <laughs> <laughs> Senator Byrd stayed for a long time, and Rockefeller's been there for a long time, but West Virginia is dysfunctional on many levels. <laughs> <laughs> you are the only state that possibly competes with Tennessee in terms of over-medication and over-medication with prescription uh, narcotics. So, it, and also, it was one of the most subsidized states in America. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. participants for weight loss and better blood pressure and you know they're financially incentivizing and eliminate outcomes. And then the other part of that question is the hospitals that are now setting up and I don't know how many there are but I'm familiar with a few, setting up almost their own ACOs for employees. So they're trying to practice by managing population <coughs> of their employees. And again they're incentivizing them but having some really good outcomes. Well uh, Herb can contradict me but uh, you think this is a carrot? They're incentivizing them to what? Keep themselves healthy, which they should have a strong self-interest to do anyway. Because this is your own body, your own temple we're talking about. But it's not a carrot. If you look at the economics of it, it's almost always a stick. Because what you're doing is you're taxing, finally, the folks who are not doing the right thing. Because that incentive is coming from the penalty that, and you don't want to admit, oh, we're going to punish smokers. Well, why not punish smokers? Because they are not only killing themselves, they are, you know, doing grievous harm to the economy. But, you know, this is tobacco culture down here. And I can introduce you to a bank, the teller windows that says, thank you for smoking. And this is not a Christopher Buckley parody here. 
this is an honest, heartfelt opinion. You know, uh, while you're in Nashville, you may want to visit the most valuable factory in the planet. It sold recently for ten and a half billion dollars, and it's just one square pile of bricks. What could they possibly be making inside there that's that valuable? Well, I've just given you a hint. You know, and this is what regular folks want to buy, and they'll pay extraordinary prices, even including the heavy federal taxes to do it. And that's a cynical tax because we don't want people to stop smoking because then we'd have no tax revenue. You know, why don't we try something effective for a change? You know, but see, we don't want that. We want this milk both sides approach. So, but it's a stick, it's not a carrot. I better run. Thank you for letting me be here. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We have uh, about 10 minutes break.